Terry McGraw. I'm the Vice President of Global Cyber Threat Analysis here at SecureWorks. I've been with the company just over eight years in total. Um, why do I cyber? Uh, I really like the aspect of protecting people and what we do at SecureWorks, you know, at the, our core is protecting people, their livelihoods, their businesses. Um, it, it marries uh, a lot of what I'm very passionate about, about serving others. Um, and coming off of my military career, uh, it made a, a very nice shift from, from that life to this life. Yeah, I got into cybersecurity later in life. Um, I, like I said, I was a, a, a soldier and a, a paratrooper for most of my career. Um, as a, a major, which is a fairly senior officer, uh, field grade officer in the Army, I got an opportunity to go to get a master's degree in telecom systems engineering. Um, and then I was selected for an Army program. I arrived at, at, at the time, the Network Enterprise and Technology Command, uh, which later became Army Cyber. Uh, and from there, I actually did a stint uh, with Army Cyber at NSA. Um, so I actually got into cyber uh, that way. And, and so working with the Army Cyber Command in the NSA, doing counterintelligence and cyber warfare operations, um, it, it really put that that bug into my soul. It uh, it was one of the most exciting and fascinating times of my career uh, to do both of that, and it gave me a great sense of of pride to be able to lead some of those those uh, uh, endeavors that we had back uh, when I was in. Secure has that same mission focus that the Army did. It has the same desire to protect people the same way we did in in the United States military, and and it has a really strong. Uh, ethical uh, and, and integrity uh, at its core. And that's what I really, really like about security. I think the most important skills for cybersecurity uh, professionals, number one, a passion for life. This is not a static environment. Tradecraft changes continually. The global underground marketplace uh, makes this a, a very dynamic environment. So you have to always be willing to learn, uh, push yourself a little bit, expand your horizons and be on that constant uh, road to improvement to stay up on the tradecraft to make yourself continually relevant and, and to sharpen your skills. The second part, I believe, is you really also, as I've said before, you have to have that desire to protect people. That's you know kind of core what we do. Um, otherwise, it's just an academic exercise. But at the end of the day, what we really do is protecting people. We protect them with their livelihoods, their businesses, um, and, and that's how they provide for their families. And so you're providing a really uh, good, solid public service. Um, and I look for that characteristic when we're hiring people. Staying up to date with the latest uh, cyber trends and the threat landscape is actually fairly easy. We, we have one of the best organizations in the world with the Counter Threat Unit. I start my morning literally every day with a cup of coffee uh, and I read these uh, threat intelligence summaries that come through, uh, the open source intelligence summary that uh, our team puts together. I read uh, any of the updates, the quarterly updates, any of the tips that come out, uh, have come out the, the, you know, the days before prior. Um, and then if I have any additional questions, I dive in uh, to their threat intelligence management system and look around. You know, if there's something specific that, you know, it comes directly from Microsoft, I may go to the source, but the beauty is the counter threat unit points me to the hyperlink to get to the source material as well. So it makes it really easy to stay up on top of the threat landscape. The industry is already starting to see that it is evolving um, with the data sciences and, and machine learning algorithms and the greater umbrella of, of artificial intelligence. I think that we're going to see the ability to do this at scale better. I, I think what we're already seeing is a shift. If you looked at the way we did cybersecurity, you know, up to the last few years, it's sort of tier one was frontline analysis triage, tier two was sort of more of that uh, the cursory threat hunting, and then tier three was incident response. I think the software, particularly in, even in Tejas, is getting to the point where tier one is done by the software. 
And so I think, you know, you're always going to need humans in the loop because you're, you're fighting against a thinking adversary who will always look for new and innovative ways uh, to, to, you know, get inside your environment. Uh, and it'll take a thinking person uh, to also you know, detect that. Um, you know, models have to be trained. Uh, I like to always say that the answers are really important if you know what questions to ask, right? And so you can build all of this, this data pool, but if you really don't have fee folks that understand what to ask of the data, um, it makes it very hard for machine learning algorithms to actually do much. Um, so I think what will shift is that a lot of the drudgery work of pulling together lots and lots of disparate data, culling that data, looking for the needle in the haystack, that will all be done uh, by software platforms like Tejas. I think it'll free up uh, people who like to do cybersecurity to spend more time looking at you know, behavior uh, and how to train those software models to find that behavior. I think that's really where it will shift. Um, and if we ever get to the point where artificial intelligence completely thinks for us, uh, you know, Skynet will come back, uh, the Terminator will arrive, and Sarah Connor will, uh, will disappear. So, I mean, but uh, in, the, in the interim, I, humans will always have a component in this. I think we'll get away from a lot of the, the, the very heavy lifting um, and be able to focus on the more esoteric portions of, of what we do in cybersecurity.